Previously on the Mongol Empire, Genghis Khan rapidly conquered northern China and Persia before dying suddenly. When he died, the Mongol army headed back to Mongolia to choose their next leader. But there was instant drama. Even before he died, there were doubts about his oldest son's paternity, and his other sons wanted to become Khan. What did he decide, and did they respect his wishes? Stay tuned as we gallop through the power struggles, the family feuds, the expansions, and the legacy that shaped not only the Mongol Empire, but also the world as we know it. What next for the largest empire in history? Let's take a step back to what happened before and after Genghis died. During his later years, Genghis had tried to get his family to agree to a clear succession plan, with his preference being his eldest son, Josh. The problem with that is that his younger sons doubted he was even Genghis's son, so they pushed for themselves to be named as successor. Josh and Chagatai, his two elder sons, got into a fight over that. For all Genghis' achievements, his biggest failing was towards his sons, who certainly meet the definition of fail sons. After their falling out, and before Genghis went to fight the biggest war of his life, he named his third son, Odegai, as his heir. But the drama re-emerged after Genghis died. To decide on a new leader, the Mongols had to show up to a cruel tie, and having a large number of important Mongols turn up for you would be enough to become Khan. The problem is that the Mongols were spread out fighting in various places, and so it took time for the Khan to be confirmed. Around two years later, Odegai was confirmed as the new Khan. Although Genghis wasn't all that into wealth and riches, his family definitely was. They called themselves the Golden Family because they were basically dripping in gold. This decadence meant they took their eye off their empire, and some cities rebelled, sensing their moment, while the family and army was distracted with the succession of Genghis. While Genghis was off conquering, the women of his family administered the empire back in Mongolia. This led to the founding of Karakoram, the new capital after his death. Initially, it was effectively a storage facility for all the wealth and loot the Mongols had taken. But now there was a new Khan, what happened to the places that rebelled during the succession? It led to the Mongols using a standing army for the first time to keep control of local population. Another issue they had was that they had conquered the richest part of the world already in Persia. So where was the new wealth going to come from? The plan was to force the conquered to send tribute to the Mongols. Small problem with that. They had already extracted most of the wealth from the conquered, and so the flood of new wealth slowed to a trip. As mentioned, the family was obsessed with the flow of wealth coming their way, and Odegai was at the forefront of that. The family was probably one of the richest of all time in terms of products they owned, but within six years of Odegai's rule, they had squandered a lot of what they had taken in Genghis's lifetime. With loot becoming less reliable and tribute not matching it, the Mongols needed to do something to feed their hunger. There were a few places Genghis hadn't conquered that could be profitable to go after, but they were indecisive. Should they attack India, the Song Dynasty in southern China, the remainder of Persia, or go find out about this faraway place called Europe. They finally decided that Europe would be next, as it was the big unknown. They already had Georgia, and now pushed north into what is Russia and Ukraine. But in that period was a group of city-states such as Muscovy, Ryazan, Novgorod, or Kiev. Like they did in Georgia, the Mongol army created confusion by sending multiple armies in different directions and stopping any of the princes from joining together. Once a city was isolated, the Mongols used their old trick of sending a small force to the city, luring the knights out on their huge horses, and once they tired, would massacre them before taking the city. By now, the Mongols had the best of Muslim and Chinese military technology, and had been using gunpowder in war for decades, but Europeans hadn't seen it before. In Riazan, they built a wooden wall around the existing city walls, which trapped the besieged inside and protected the Mongols from the defensive archers. They then launched many things into the city, including fireworks and grenades. This caused fear inside the trapped defenders. After five days, they attacked and took it quickly. Unprecedented for a walled city in this era. As we saw in the last video, they generally released the civilians in this campaign so that nearby cities would look to surrender before fighting. This is when Western Europe started to become aware of the Mongols. Our old friend Matthew Paris got his reports from these civilians. There were rumours that the Mongols were a lost Jewish tribe looking to take revenge on the Christians for their treatment of Jews. So naturally, some places in the Holy Roman Empire doubled down on their anti-Semitism. After Russia, the Mongols went south into Poland. They faced a huge army, possibly the largest collection of knights in Europe. Duke Henry looked to fight them in Leibniz and end the threat. But what did the Mongols do against such odds? They ran away. They also used smoke and gunpowder to create distractions and hide themselves. Once the knights had tired a bit and were disorganized, the Mongols picked them off. Duke Henry and up to 25,000 knights and soldiers were killed. Onwards the Mongols went, towards Hungary. 
quickly wiped that army out, and the reports of this caused full-on panic around Europe as to who would be next. The Pope tried to sound all authoritarian and tell the Mongols to leave, but they told him to keep his mouth shut. During all this, the previous issues with succession reappeared, not amongst Genghis' sons, but his grandsons this time. Rather than fighting together for the common cause, they fought for personal glory that might help them become the next Khan. Put a pin in that for now. So the Mongols are in Hungary and Poland, with all of Europe open to them. Where next? Remember, they had started this campaign for loot, and although they had decimated the armies they came across, what they actually found was a relatively poor part of the world. I'm not saying Eastern Europe was particularly poor, Europe as a whole was, and was way behind China and Persia, which the Mongols had already conquered. They were more than a little disappointed. Only the kings and nobles had goods worth taking, and so overall it wasn't a productive campaign. So they actually stopped the invasion of Europe themselves, as it just wasn't worth the effort when they could get more in other parts of the world. But the lack of loot wasn't the only reason the invasion stopped. No large European force came together to defeat them. Instead, the Mongols had reached the natural end of the ideal terrain they liked to fight on. Almost unbroken between Siberia, Korea, Mongolia, Russia, and Poland and Hungary is a strip of flat grassland we call steppe. But once they reached Hungary and Austria, they were at a disadvantage on their horses. Not even farmland was a good substitute for the steppe, but European knighthood was in disarray. Walled cities were ineffective, and heavy knights were out of fashion almost overnight. They took control of Russia and Ukraine, but in Europe, as quickly as they had arrived, they vanished. The combination of nothing being worth taking and non-ideal fighting conditions weren't the only reasons for the end of the conquest in Europe. Odegai, the Khan, died, along with another of Genghis's kids, Chagatai. On the way home to choose the next Khan, they sold a group of captured European men to the Genoese in Crimea. Stick a pin in that for now. So what happened after Chagatai and Odegai died in quick succession? As we know, the women of the family ran the empire while conquest was happening. The queens looked to get their own sons installed as the next Khan. You may remember that to become Khan, you needed a Horaltai to be called, and if a majority of the Mongols and increasingly the Golden Family showed up for you, then you were Khan. Simple as that. But no one could get that majority, so Odegai's wife, Torijan, was effectively a regent for five years while she tried to maneuver her son, Goyuk, as the next Khan. While all of this was happening, a spy of the Pope and a disciple of Francis of Assisi visited the Mongols. This was an increasingly common thing. The spy was Carpini, and he was sent with a letter from Pope Innocent IV demanding the Mongols convert to Christianity and stop attacking Europeans. The Mongol response was to tell Carpini to ask the Pope how he knew what God wanted, and that clearly they were the ones that held the fate of the world in their hands. Needless to say, the relationship never got better than that. The real reason Carpini was even there was because Torijen finally got her way. Goyuk became Goyuk Khan, and the leader of the Mongols. She invited delegates from the empire and beyond to come and pay homage to their new master, and many visited. However, the maneuvering of the last five years had caused tensions in the family, the first major fallout since Genghis had died. Torijen had a favoured advisor who wasn't Mongol, which made Goyuk suspicious. First Torijen mysteriously died, then the advisor was brutally tortured and murdered. This went against Mongol rules of how women should be treated, but it was probably explained away because she wasn't Mongol. Now he was Khan, Goyuk was brutal. He killed his own uncle and removed Chagatai's wife Yesodun's control of Central Asia and Persia. He decided it was time to finish off Europe and take what little loot there was for himself. On the way there, he mysteriously died. So who became Khan now? Genghis' son Toloi died within a few years of Genghis, but through his wife Sogotan, all four of his sons would play a huge part in the future of the empire. Between them, they would push the Mongol Empire to its largest size. First up was Mok Khan. During all of this, Karakoram was being built up from being a mere storage facility to being a full-on capital. They made use of European workmen that had impressed the Mongols during the invasion there. Visitors were later amazed by it as it had a very unusual style. Sogotan supported new buildings and the printing of books. But after she died, some of the unity between the Mongols fell apart. With the empire back on stable footing, Monk decided that Europe was definitely not the way forward, and that they would finish the job they had started in Persia and China instead. He sent one of his brothers, Hulagu, to finish off the rest of Persia and Arabia. In Hulagu's way were the assassins. Yeah, Assassin's Creed fans, assassins actually existed. They are the reason we have the word. The name came from the fact that they smoked hashish. 
and they killed anyone in their way. They were kind of a permanent thorn in the side of the Mongols, even from Genghis's days, and so they had to go. The only problem was that they were in mountaintop forts, hardly ideal territory for horseback archers. Nevertheless, with some surprises here or there and the capture of the assassin's leader, they opened the route up to their main goal, Baghdad, probably the richest city in the world at the time. It was controlled by the Abbasid Caliphate. When Hulagu sent a list of demands, the Caliph defied him and said the Muslim world would rise up to the Caliph. They didn't. Instead, the Georgians and Armenians joined the Mongols and helped to surround Baghdad. They scared the local population so they would overwhelm it with refugees. As Hulagu was Christian, he sent Christian spies to try to persuade the Christians in the city to side with the Mongols. They did. The Caliph was scared and suddenly offered to be subservient to the Great Khan. But it was too late now that Hulagu could see how the richest city in the world could be his. The Mongol army used gunpowder to surprise the defenders by firing projectiles at them. They had what were basically prototype cannons, grenades and guns. The defenders weren't used to being attacked by someone they couldn't fight back against and panicked. Hulagu also flooded the Tigris to force the defending army into the city. Within five days of the flood and firepower, the Caliph surrendered. The people were ordered to leave the city so looting could begin, but likely out of fear they didn't. Many were killed for disobeying the order. Christians and their property were left alone for helping in the siege, but many others lost family, friends and their life. Among all of this, more disaster struck. It's unclear if it was deliberate or not, but the city was set alight. Damascus followed swift. This was a low point for the Islamic empires that rose up after Muhammad. Almost every major city was captured within 40 years of Genghis' initial attack on Bukhara. Only Arabia and North Africa remained under Muslim control, so obviously Hulagu knew where to head next. But as they reached the Mediterranean and headed towards Cairo and Egypt, an army marched out to fight them. They were the Mamluks. Remember those Europeans the Mongols sold to the Germans on their way back from Hungary? Those soldiers made up a chunk of the land. So no problem, right? Not so fast. The Mongols lost and lost badly. This ended up being the western limit of their empire. While all of this was going on, Hulagu and Monk's other brother, Kublai, was slowly making his way south into the Song Dynasty in China. But he wasn't a capable fighter himself, and he struggled to do what was required. Monk wasn't happy and summoned Kublai back to explain himself in Karakorum. He decided he would lead the army himself and get Kublai to end the religious conflicts in the territory instead. He left his youngest brother, Eric Bok, behind to keep control of the homeland. The climate and diseases in southern China were unusual to the Mongols, and they struggled. And Monk suddenly died himself around the time the Mongols had lost to the Mamluks. He was the last undisputed Khan of the Mongols. The peak of the empire had almost been reached. So how did it end? Watch this to see.